So welcome. Um, lots of people who sit on this couch can say that they've influenced sort of something or someone, but there aren't many people who can say they've kind of basically kickstarted a whole genre. Um, we're going to be talking about all sorts of things, uh, you know, early New York and more recent stuff. But first off, I think we should just give a very, very big warm welcome to Todd Edwards. Thank you. Are you green? Is it green? It's green. Testing. Um, so, like I said, we are going to go back and talk about the kind of, you know, sort of halcyon days of New York house and garage. But the first thing I wanted to ask you is you've you kind of just come back from some little mini tours in London and in Austria, also in the UK and in Austria, and you've just come back from Mexico. And I wondered whether it felt like your sound has kind of been rediscovered again by the whole world. Uh, yeah, it was, it's kind of interesting. I had taken a two-year hiatus off, um, kind of had a, a parting of ways with the old label I was on and reached kind of a low in the slash independent music market with piracy kind of taking over all the and killing off a lot of old labels. And uh, it was funny when I uh, came back, like I decided after two years of working a regular job and wanting to jump off a bridge, I decided that... Uh, you know, I, w I wanted to, to dive in full time. And at the height of the, the American recession, I just decided to quit the job and to take a chance and go back in full time again. And it was at that point I realized it was uh, I was it was it was I was blessed that it actually happened at that time. I was I was getting interviewed and dubstep obviously was, you know, really big. And one of the questions that this interviewer asked me over the phone is like, how do you feel that you're having like dubstep producers like say that you're one of their influences? And I was like. I honestly didn't really even know too much about dubstep at the time. Like I heard some of it like in, I guess, 2007. I'm like, this sounds like Timberland Productions, you know. Um, and I was like, wow, it's amazing. Like the timing couldn't have been more impeccable because, you know, the fact that I'm being uh, recognized as an influence, like, I, you know, I didn't know that that was the case. So it was almost like an, uh, the first introduction back into the scene. And it took about a year of uh, having a really good manager to really kind of put my face back on the map of the scene because everyone's always like, where did he go? What, you know, what happened over those two years? You know, it's funny. Don't take, don't take any time off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think um, for people who were kind of there at the time, they would have a, a kind of finely nuanced idea of the difference between house and garage. Yeah. But it might not be quite so obvious. And also the kind of ideas of those things change over time, don't they? They're different to people who might think about it now or hear those records now than yes. they were at the time. Can you break down for us what those two things mean to you? Originally, um, I was only trying to uh, come up with my uh, own sound. Um, I was very heavily influenced by Masters at Work. Uh, Kenny Dope Gonzalez's drum programming was he had these wonderfully shuffly beats, and we can play a track by him after. Um, so I was, you know, shuffly 16 triplets were very big. And then you had someone like MK. Uh, Mark Kitchens, who uh, cut up vocals, and I was highly influenced by that, and uh, basically put those two concepts together. And uh, I, I'm, a lot of people probably already know this, but I was also loved Enya, and she used her vocals as musical elements. So I was like, why not if I take you know sampled vocals and make those the instruments instead of uh, you know organs or pianos and whatnot? And I just kind of put this together. So it kind of had a very shuffly sound. I was also using, I had an old Insonic EPS keyboard, which had about 15 seconds of, or 15 to 30 seconds of sampling time. But the, the quantize on there was amazing. It had this great, like, you know, really hard triplet uh, shuffle. So that, that kind of really made this sound uh, what it was. And when it took off, you had uh, kids trying to imitate that. So, I mean, to me, it was just house music with, you know, shuffly beats. Maybe it was just that I made very sloppy sounding house music, but I, you know, I, my roots are in house music. It just so happens that in England, it started to, uh, they started to speed up the tempo. Um, it started to get the, the coin phrase speed garage, which is not exactly uh, a positive uh, phrase. Like, you know, st people started to wanting to uh, want to disassociate with speed garage and there was kind of almost like a riff between house music and uh garage uh a uk garage at the time but i would just say the difference is is that house music is much smoother sounding um maybe not as uh, especially these days it's less uh sample involved i think i mean i think it's obvious that most people have been using 
more you know synths and there's a move there is a move back to 90s house and you know organs and pianos and whatnot but sampling still is not as uh, dominant as it was at the time in UK garage is that, is that clear enough? Yeah, so really for you, the difference is house was kind of smoother and garage was more... Shuffly based. and, you know, swingy beats and whatnot. And again, a lot more sampling than is in house music these days. So, mm. And was there a kind of point where you as a, a music fan could pinpoint where that shift happened? Like, was it, is it MK or, or were there a kind of bunch of people who made that transition? Um... You know, I, I can't say that I know the exact transition point because I listened to a lot of house music in the early days, like from 90 to around 93. I did nothing but listen to house music. And I wasn't really exposing myself to like Chicago house or anything that was going on in L.A. Or I was honestly just listening to what was on the radio in New York. On At the time, you had people like Tony Humphreys and uh, uh, I'm trying to think who else, like... There was like Red Alert, he played hip hop, but there was, there was a bunch of DJs on the radio at the time that were actually, you know, had these house shows at night, uh, Glenn Frisha, you know, and so I would just, I have cassettes, like loads of cassettes that I would just record and do, I still have them someplace where it's just like, you know, listen to those on campus as I was going to college. I barely went to co like class. I would just like kind of walk around with my headphones on and stuff. Um... Go on. I, I just wondered about, you know, you said you've got the cassette somewhere. Like, do you remember the last time that you sort of reached back and listened to them? <laughs> well, funny enough, before I moved to uh, L.A., I had to, like, go through these cassettes to determine what I was keeping or not. So I got a little little throwback, you know, recently. So. And was there anything that kind of that you noticed about them that maybe wasn't apparent to you at the time? Or, or like, what was the main thing that you saw about them or felt about them listening to them kind of n now? Um, aside from the nostalgia, I, I mean, to me, I mean, I, I, it could be just that I'm biased towards that time period, but I, I just think that between 90 and 93 is like one of my favorite generations of house music. Uh, I think you had a lot of producers before, I, in, in my personal opinion, before hip hop really kicked in, you had a lot of producers that were making house music. So you were getting a, a really good sound coming out of the very soulful very raw, very underground. And, uh, you know, after that time period, it just seemed like that, that whole deep underground sound started to change and get a little bit more progressive and, you know, less soulful, to be honest. So, And, and sort of seeing as we've kind of found ourselves psychogeographically mm -hmm. in New York in the yeah. early 90s, could you kind of give us a bit of, uh, paint us a picture, give us a bit of color about what it was like at that time. I mean, I know that you went to the shelter and the yeah, sound yeah. factory bar yeah, on sound a factory night. bar was amazing. Um, I, always, I always tell the same story. Uh, one of the best uh, nights was, it was the night before Thanksgiving, right before, it was like right during the release of Masters at Work uh, dropping uh, I Can't Get No Sleep featuring India. And it, this, this was an amazing house track and she had, the, there was a part in the song that it just had this transition and India just has this epic voice and, she winded up like she goes up like and sings this like you know this glissando up and she and the music changes and the crowd went ballistic like when they when you hear when they heard it and it was just like the energy in the room was, was magnetic that i mean and again at the time when i was younger i didn't really dj so to you know to see this happen in a club was like my first like the first landmark occasion where i was like a got a dose of like what an audience uh, how an audience reacts to a, a good dj or a good uh, performance but if you kind of not necessarily literally but kind of close your eyes and see yourself in that room mm -hmm. and you look around what do you see um you mean as far as like the vibe in the room yeah just kind of who's there what do they look like what kind of mix of people what's going on um <sighs> I mean, it was it was pretty mellow, you know. It's it's. I mean, you know, looking out into the audience, you had a good mix of people. I mean, it was like white, black, you know, Hispanic, gay, straight. It was a very open club. The smell of marijuana la laced the room. It was good. There was, you know, what I mean, uh, there was the upstairs. The upstairs section was probably a room not too much bigger than this. And uh, again, it was all about just, you know, you were there, there was always uh, producers that showed up, like Todd Terry would show up and I would always like bother the hell out of him and tell him how great he was. Um, uh, who else? How would he what? respond to your bothering? He was a little, <laughs> he was a little, uh, you know, he was patient at first, but you could tell I was annoying the hell out of him after a while because I would do it. I can't help it. He was a role model at the time, you know, so, and uh, just, 
you know. I've just got this funny image now in my head of <laughs> the kind of, you know, Todd meets Todd. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> it's Todd so, squared. Yeah. <laughs> so, and he was the original Todd the God too, uh -huh. so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did he, do you think he ever minded the kind of, that you got the kind of God suffix i'm i mean i don't i would hope not i mean he's he's had so many accomplishments i mean that i mean i'm very thankful for everything that i've accomplished but he's he's hit so many different genres you know i mean like had so many pop hits and worked with so many artists so if uh if it bothered him i would think that would be very <laughs> kind of you know shallow-minded of him i don't so. really mean it, it was, <laughs> i know it was a throwaway thing really um i mean that's definitely seen as a kind of a real golden age of a certain type of house music. Yeah. Did it feel like that at the time? Uh, no, I don't think. I don't think any time you, you know, you're going through something, you can really see it for all it is, until you you get a retrospective on it. You I know, think sometimes at the time though, I think if you've ever been somewhere that where really amazing stuff's happening, yeah. then you recognize it again. Well, let's put it this way: whose phone is going? No, just <laughs> um, for me. I'm a very picky person when it comes to music, honestly. It's like after three years of listening to house music, I, I kind of got sick of listening to house music only because the the New York scene was kind of using the same chords over and over again. And it kind of just is like, okay, I've, I've learned everything. Like once you start really understanding what's going on production-wise, you need something more challenging. And, uh, you know, so I started to go back uh, to other genres of music. But at the time, I, like I said, I just... I just loved uh, what all the producers were doing up to about 94. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you know, sounds start to change. You know, I mean, everyone goes into a different direction. So I guess, I mean, if you want to look at it that way, you know, if if those few years were, were, you know, what I listened to mostly and then I stopped, yeah, I guess that would be the golden age mm -hmm. for me, you know. So I guess it seems like what you're saying is that there was a part of your brain when you were there at the shelter or mm. listening nonstop yeah. to house records or taping stuff off the radio that was kind of assimilating what you were hearing, working out how it was done, yes. and then kind of getting to a point where you were going to do stuff yourself. Yes. Well, I mean, that's the thing. It's um, I started to, you know, the more years you spend making music, the more you start to understand it. Uh, I don't know about, um, you know, what you're producing, but I would strongly suggest to definitely learn chords, musical chords on the piano, like inside and out, it's definitely helpful. There's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword because you can start to think too much inside the box, but it's so much easier once you start understanding how chords are put together in their different inversions, and it just it makes coming up with music so much easier. I've, you know, I've seen, I've heard you say that before, actually. Mm -hmm. That kind of your best bit of advice for anyone producing yes. electronic music yeah. is to kind of, you know, start playing the piano. Yeah. And I know that you had kind of played a little bit and had been around people that were playing. Um, I think we should hear some of your music. Sure, yeah, definitely. Very shortly. So, would you kind of say that basically at this point, when you're just primed to start making music yourself, you're kind of equally informed by a kind of sort of familial, family-based kind of musicality as you are by kind of all the house music you've been mainlining for the last four or five years. You mean, wait, that say, say, that, say that one, one more time. <laughs> <laughs> was, was, I got a bit complex. No, no that's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm so simple -minded. I'm just wondering whether or not what you're saying is that, or whether it's true to say that for you, when you were just about to start making music, you were just as informed by a kind of musicality and, and kind of playing of music mm -hmm. as you were by all the house music that you had been um, kind of absorbing I um, I mean, as far as for, uh, a when I first was getting out of high school, I had taken a year and a half of piano, so I had a basic understanding that way. Um, I was also exposed to a lot of disco. From my sister is nine years older than me, so I kind of took all the you know uh, her musical cues from what she listened to as well. And I listened to a lot of pop music growing up. Um, the thing about house music was I at first initially looked at it as being this simple art form that was going to be an easy way to break in the music industry, and though it took. It, I mean, it, it did only take a couple of years for me, but I, I was humbled by the fact that it wasn't as easy as I initially. Just because something sounds simple doesn't mean it's easy to make, you know. And it really, you know, it's and, and again, even just listening to like I, I learned as I listened, but diving in and getting your hands dirty and and really making it. The more music you make, the better you are. That's why I think why you know you could be a great DJ and know what sounds great. That doesn't necessarily mean as soon as you sit down at the keyboard. You're gonna make an amazing track. It's 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 
its own art form. So you need to just keep doing it and doing it and you hone your craft and you get better and better at it. So so while we just find a track, can you just tell us which disco records you particularly liked from your sister's record collection? Uh, disco, disco. Um, I mean, I was into a lot of Quincy Jones. I didn't even know, but to be honest, I didn't know. Um, like I wasn't good with names ever. So, you know... You know, there were there were summers where it's, you know, it's like the SOS band, you know, like the pop disco stuff. Um, you would hear, I mean, there was Stevie Wonder on the radio. Um, who else? Who else? Uh, I'm trying to think. Quincy Jones, like stuff off the dude, you know, like uh, that I would discover later on. I'm like, oh, that's Quincy Jones. And then you like, you know, you would realize he's behind so many productions and, you know. So I like again. It was if it wasn't for my friend Rich Creso, who is uh, I've co-produced with, I would have never thought to like look at production names and stuff. I was clueless with them. I'm horrible with names. So, but um, okay. And so, should we hear a kind of not your first release, but one of your early releases? Sure. Uh, Guide my soul. And then we'll hear a bit, and then you can tell us something about it. Okay. So, what had you kind of figured out how to do by then? Uh, um, well, first of all, the, the earliest label that I was on, uh, or the one most uh, that's worth recognizing, is 111 East Records. And uh, prior to working on that label, I didn't do a lot of sampling as far as drums were concerned. Uh, James Branton worked with a, a singer named Sybil. And uh, he was he was good at ripping people off. He like he, No, seriously, he came to England. You remember the track Pump Up the Volume? Uh, which was huge in the in the mid '80s, and he went over to England and heard this, and came back with that like baseline sound, and did. Uh, Sybil had a track called "My Love Is Guaranteed," and he like did a whole mix with that baseline, and it caused this whole lawsuit. And I heard it on the radio before I knew it. I'm like, when I met him, like that was you, really, you know. And even when Soul to Soul uh, came up with that drum pattern, you know, doom, doom, st- and he he uh, did another song called "Don't Make Me Over." It was a remake and uh, had Sybil sing it, but like he he picked the cues up from England. And that's the one thing about not having internet back then. You know, there was a delay between something hitting. So if England, you know, someone in England was coming up with something amazing and you caught wind of that, you could bring it back to your country and do your thing with it. So what was the original question? The question really was just kind of like, you know, by the time you're making this, oh, yeah. what have you figured yeah. out to do? You know, what's going yeah, on? Yeah, no, well, he was like, he's like, why don't you, because I was using an, uh, I had a Yamaha RY30 drum machine, mm-hmm. which, you know, had basic sounds and whatnot, but he's like, you know, why don't you start sampling your drum sounds instead of uh, using this drum machine? And the minute I did that, it actually enhanced all my tracks. If you, I, you know, it's too bad you don't have some of like we didn't do this sooner to get some of the one eleven E stuff because I, I, I'm I'm thankful that I was on the label, but I wasn't too proud of the productions compared to like once I finally developed a sound. But you know, the minute that you had these these rough raw drum sounds going on, it completely enhanced the track again. With even with the the quantize on the drums, one of the other thing to notice this was the first EP. I've always been into putting positive messages in my work, and then I started to kind of put subliminal messages about God without being too overt or too in your face about it. But like, you know, in this uh, track, if you listen to the samples closely, it's saying he can solve it, trust, love. So you can know. you, you know, like it's kind of playing at the moment, can you find a bit and show on, us where on they that are? Particular, yeah, yeah. On that track? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's saying he can solve it, trust, love. He can solve it. This is what love's about. It says guide my soul. So, so, you know, so whatever. I started doing that, and uh, I don't know. I just wanted people to know that positive things come from God, and that you know, beauty comes from God. And most people don't really associate God with anything positive, to be honest. So, uh, one thing that I was interested in actually, because you were brought up Catholic. And I well Catholic for oh sorry go on yeah so so kind of for a portion of your life you were brought up in the Catholic faith Ca- Catholic for until second grade uh-huh. and then this small non not denominational fire and brimstone church mm-hmm. that almost destroyed me oh. after that so yes yeah. so. even worse than the Catholics yes wow, that's no no definitely job. I would it gave Catholicism a run for its money yeah, yeah definitely so well because the thing I was interested in as someone who was also brought up as a Catholic yes. and also totally fell massively in love with house music. Yeah. I wondered whether or not you thought there was something about that experience of being in church, priest kind of telling you stuff, um, the kind of feeling, uh, the sort of general feeling and the kind of musical feeling that you get from Catholicism or maybe faith in general that predisposes you to liking house music. 
Um, I, I, I definitely, definitely think house music is extremely spiritual. I think it comes. I think I, I have my own way of looking at music. I feel like there's this, uh, this instinctual vibe that you know it's the harder things like you know metal, you know heavy metal, you know the, the harder dubstep, you know I, like even like maybe some drum and bass like the hard, you know anything that's hard it comes from like a more tribal instinctual place, and then you have the opposite end which is the spiritual side, like things that are soulful, things that are more musical based that come from, you know, I don't know, from maybe a more uh, cerebral place. And then there's everything in the middle, you know, hybrids between the two. And I think that, uh, I think it's good to have things that have that soulful side. It doesn't necessarily have to sound like gospel music, but anything that that comes from a cerebral place I think has a, a longevity about it. And I think that things, I mean, and this is just like after 20 years of listening to music, things that are usually harder that, uh, you know, uh, that, that are, have this massive like instant impact, I think they burn twice as bright and then they just die out. And, you know, I don't, I mean, like there's, think about like all the techno music from the 90s, you know, I mean, tracks that were huge, like The Dominator, <laughs> you know, <laughs> James Brown is dead. It's like, does anyone in this room really know those tracks? It's like, you know, is anyone studying that? But yet you can throw on a Todd Terry track and it sounds as fresh as it did when it was first made. And I think most people, you know, are, you know, they, they hear these tracks, they're classics. They, they, they stand the test of time. So. so I guess we should move on to something else, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. House versus techno, do metal versus soul. Yeah, yeah. Aside. And I'm not knocking, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying anything negative about the I think they're they're both two strong energy sources. Um and if you combine them properly, you can make something that, you know, that blows up and can last stand the test of time. So sticking actually slightly with this kind of faith aspect, I know that you kind of dropped out of uh, active faith for a while mm -hmm. um before kind of refinding your place, mm -hmm. a place that suited you within a kind of faith context. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered whether or not you were making these kind of spiritual sounding house garage records, whether whether or not this kind of you were making this music whilst you were not in the faith and the kind of music brought you back to it or whether or not kind of coming back into faith took you to the music. Like which way around did it happen? Uh, we're talking about the records you're making at you this time. I have to say, I, I'm, how long have you been... How long have you been a journalist now? It's been like, no, I mean, honestly, you ask some of the most amazingly intelligent questions like that. They're challenging. No, seriously. It's like, I, you know, when you, you've, you've been asked questions year after year and everyone uses the same slate, like you're really like challenging. I, I feel stupid. I feel stupid right now. It's amazing. Well, I have, so. I have a, a slight. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> But with that I'm question, not gonna, I'm going to get the answers well, to you. I will. But the thing is, actually, interestingly, with that question, I um, I spoke to uh, Zed Bias. OK. Yeah. And I said to him, I'm interviewing uh, Todd Edwards. What would you ask him? And that was his question. So he's the person okay. who gets the props well, for being all, super no, brainy. But the other ones before I was like, uh, because, come again? Yeah, no, like, because you know. his question was, what came first, religion or the kind of music that sounded like they were kind of... <clears throat> songs in praise of god i think you know what it is i think it kind of walked hand in hand mm -hmm. i mean i have i mean my 20s i was a mess just i have no problem saying it it was uh you know i don't even care to remember most of my 20s you know um i think that you know even in high school i started to find myself naturally starting to infuse <laughs> god into my work and it wasn't a force it wasn't anything forced it just kind of came natural um you know, and then again, like I said, with with the beginning of making house music, I wanted to to write something relevant. You know, and you you had spoken earlier when we were just talking about gospel house music. I you know I I didn't listen to a lot of gospel house music, but there were a lot of dance tracks that would you know have just simple phrases like freedom or you know joy or just like love, and it was just they were so simple that they almost became cliche to me. And I wanted or unity. That was another one. Like they, that's that's the and they're great themes. Don't get me wrong. That's that is house music. It brings us all together. Um, but I wanted to get more specific and uh, take it to a more specific love and a specific unity. And it was you know and God was that for me. And uh, you know I had really rough times and you know I tried to write about those. And you know there were you know again it was almost like when you feel like you're bottoming out, you you kind of throw your hands up and. 
you know, and even in later years, to be honest, I, I felt like I needed a mission. Like I needed something to live for, to be honest. I mean, I, I really did hit a point where it's just like, why am I here? Why do I have to be here? And like, not that I would ever be suicidal, but it's just like, and it was kind of like, you know, I just felt the need to, you know, try to spread. I, I, I went through a healing process and I wanted to spread that love with everyone else. Like, hey, this happened to me. This is what got me through it. Maybe you could do it for you. Maybe it can't, but at least I could try to throw that out there. If you hear the message, great. If not, the music is still good enough, I would say. You know? So when you were making tracks like The Praise, mm -hmm. is that was that in response to kind of having found faith again or kind of at a point where you hadn't? Yet? Um, that was still early on. And like I said, there was a couple years, like I would say the first couple of years out of high school that I just kind of had that little rebellious attitude. Like I said, I was, I had, I had religion forced down my throat. I mean, I love my dad dearly, but it was just the religious arguments growing up. And, uh, yeah, my nephew knows We've that nephew. one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, so I kind of kept God at arm's length per se. Um, but I still had that thing. Like I said, I, I wanted to make positive messages and, you know, it wasn't like I hated God or, but you know, I just think I got more involved as years went on. So that was still kind of like, had a couple down points right before those tracks dropped. I was, uh, I can give you a personal story. I, I had, I was working my butt off. I mean, <clears throat> there was a, uh, I don't know if you know what Latin freestyle it is. It kind of sounds like two step, but it was like, you know, it was big in the late eighties and there was a certain uh, music producer named Andy Panda Tripoli who we went and I brought my, the first track I ever really tried to shop was a freestyle track called Rejection. It was about like trying to ask a girl out. And, uh, you know, his, his wisdom to me and my friend was like, you know, eat, sleep and shit music. That's what he said. So, and that's exactly what I did when most people were going out to college parties. I was home on a Friday night, you know, working on music and kept trying to do it. And, you know, when you work so hard at something, and uh, you're getting, you know, again, you're young, you want instant results, you know, you, you just think that you should, your second record or your second, tr second track should like blow up or something. So I had a couple things out and I always wanted to have my music played on this uh, one radio station that DJ Disciple uh, had. He had his, I, I loved his show. I mean, DJ Disciple's show was amazing. It was, uh, it was college radio and, you know, everyone tuned in to hear the newest tracks before they were out. It's like, that was the other thing too, is like you have the internet you can get stuff on SoundCloud. Back then, it was like to have a dub plate or you know something before anyone else. I was like an amazing. Oh my God, what is that? It's not out yet. You know, it's Masters at Work something. But uh, you know, I wanted my track played on his show and like the first couple releases I did on One Eleven, nothing. You know, and my friend came along who wasn't really. You know, he was kind of like going out and stuff. He he made one track in his bedroom and brought it to the sound factory bar and downstairs as I met uh, little Louis Vega was upstairs in the main room downstairs was DJ Camacho now DJ Camacho uh, Camacho he passed away but he was a really big teddy bear of a guy really nice uh, DJ from Jersey and uh, he would have like a cassette deck that actually had like speed control on that which is at the time no one really had that um, and we just play loads of cassettes of people just giving them their demos and my friend you know gave it to him and everyone was reacting in the room and that was the first time I ever felt jealousy, like, you know, this coveting feeling. I went home depressed that night. And I, honestly, I was like, you know, when you're, I mean, and I, he was my best friend, so I felt more guilty about that than anything. I, and I told him about it, but it was just like, you know, I felt horrible about myself. I'm like, but I was thinking, like, I'm busting my ass doing this. You know, and he comes along and just does this one track. And all of a sudden, like, you know, you know, that, that was horrible feeling, you know, because knowing how much time I've been putting in. Had you been giving your music out as well? Well, I mean, I had I had a official releases. This wasn't even an official release. This is just something he did, recorded on cassette. And like DJ Disciple came up and he's like, what's this? And I'm like, uh, really? You know, like, you know, and I felt horrible, you know, for both reasons, you know, for the jealousy aspect and whatever. Um, but that week I actually came up with a couple tracks um, that became, uh, that were put on on Nervous Records and stuff. But, you know, uh, I got the response from Disciple and I felt redeemed per se and I felt better and I realized having faith is definitely a good place to be and and also maybe a tiny bit of friendly competition friendly <laughs> yeah. rivalry can well you know what the well. thing is I'm not a very competitive person it was just like like I said I mean like I'm living breathing this stuff and I guess I was judging the fact that I didn't feel like you know he was you know he was due because I know like you know again we were all going out to college parties my friends were in frat frat houses and stuff but it was just like I was just jealous it was just a normal you know 
human jealousy, you know. So, And there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I think you'll find a few people in the room who will have maybe experienced something similar. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what should we, should we hear? What should we hear a bit of then? Uh, what do you got? Well, because we were talking about the praise. Okay. Um, oh, we well, should. there's a couple. I mean, it depends what you want to hit. Like, Save My Life is a landmark track in my, you know, that, that, uh, you know, that put me on the map. Mm-hmm. Um, Alabama Blues, you, if you want to do, do you have the, well, you have the before and after? Yeah, we've got that here. We could, uh, we could head to France. I'll tell you what, let's hear a little bit more of kind of your music that kind of set you up first before yeah. we head into some foreign okay. climbs. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. So, yeah. so what are we going to go for? Save My Life? Save My Life. That yeah. was, that was one of the tracks that kind of put me on the map as uh, Todd Edwards. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, actually, it just occurs to me before we start kind of taking it out to national, um, we should talk a little bit more about the kind of the sort of famous, famous aspect of your sampling style and maybe play something to illustrate it. And perhaps you can kind of break down sure, sure. what went into a track. Yeah. Um, so the thing that you're kind of famous for is kind of using tiny, tiny, tiny samples, micro samples, micro yeah. samples, you know, like. 50, 75, I don't know, however many you would... Yeah, but the earlier tracks track. didn't have as many. I didn't have room on the sampler to do that. Um, but, you know, as I got more equipment, I started to go crazy with, like, you know, just... It could be more than 100 in a track at times. So I'm interested as well, like, why you would do that? Because in a way, you'd probably... There'd be people who might say, we can't do that, that's wrong, that's too many. You, you know, there'd, there'd be kind of a certain type of person or a certain type of artist that would think that would be the wrong thing to do. So how did you end up in a situation where you just kind of went mental and, and more did and more. so many? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, A, I never really read reviews to say, you know, like I kind of just, uh, my ex-manager kind of, I mean, all managers, they shelter you from the negativity and I don't go, I, you know, I wasn't looking for any c- criticism. So basically... I based my career on how well the remixes were coming in. Like, you know, if remixes were coming in, I knew I was doing something right. Uh, if they weren't, you know, there were, there was, again, your career is always, you know, for most people anyway, it's like this, 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 you know, and there were times where it was, uh, you know, things die down and, it, you know, all of a sudden you do something and all of a sudden, bam, you're back on the map. But uh, I don't know. I mean, people were accepting of this, you know, of a lot of samples. I mean, like that one in particular, uh, is a good example of like I didn't know Stevie Wonder's songs in the key of life. Uh, that song would have never came to fruition because that whole choiry sound is from the first track on that album. I don't know if that. Well, I just to say when we released it on uh, London Records, I had to resing most of the parts. So we'll just say that it was resung and not the actual samples. <laughs> but you know, so <laughs> yeah, exactly. Of course, of course, you know. So. Um, so yeah, it was uh I don't know. I mean, I was I think people were intrigued by it, I guess. I mean, you know, I never really asked anyone why they liked what I did. I just kind of kept doing it, you know. Okay. But I mean, I can say at this point in time things have gotten a lot simpler. Um I'm not one to just change directions just because I want to follow so I don't like following other people's trends but i do believe in growing from them and trying to like you know you take what other people are doing and let it infuse into your work living in la has definitely had a major impact with that um especially from you know it, well first of all deep house in itself is is just blown up again and you know it's like you know you would see on sound like you were going to ask this anyway so it's, it's like uh, <laughs> you know if you don't mind let's we'll just go right into it uh the you know uh, i was you know i have my soundcloud account and you see YouTube and like, you know, I'm not that I'm not dissatisfied with the amount of hits that I get. But, you know, it's like I'll max out maybe on a track about 7000 hits and then I'll go to some house track, you know, and it like would have like 50,000 hits. And I'm listening to the track and I'm like, OK, it's good. You know what I mean? But I'm not like blown away by it. And so I'm like thinking, OK, what's what am I missing here? It's like, I, I don't think I'm a bad producer. So, and then I kind of realize it's all supply and demand. You know, it's like uh, the garage stuff becomes, a, you know, is, is always, you know, there was one time where it was huge in, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And uh, then it kind of, you know, things flare up and then they go back down into like an underground thing. And it's, you know, it's a niche market, you know. And because I was one of the innovators, you know, there's me and a few others that innovated the sound. I, you know, I was continuing, continually able to still get work and DJ based on that, you know, and it's, I'm very blessed to have the respect. But at the same time, 
I started to look at music as a communication more than just um, a musical form. So even though I want to create great art, I would like to be able to reach as many people as I can. So I was like, how do you do that without losing your integrity and just like jumping on someone else's bandwagon? And fortunately, Deep House coming back around is amazing because those are my roots are in Deep House. And I, you know, my earlier tracks were more Deep House than the, you know, this other direction. I kind of took the UK Garage thing into, um, you know, again, excessive amounts of sampling. So I started to streamline my tracks a little bit and remixes and um, it's paid off, smoothing it out a little bit, still kind of has the essence of what I'm doing, but just reaching more house market than just the niche UK garage market. Well, I think it would be nice to talk a bit more about the rough stuff. At sure. Some point. No, yeah, yeah, but yeah, definitely. I guess we've kind of arrived at a point where we probably should, we could possibly play your, the new mix you just did for Jesse Ware. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. That's a, that's a good example of, you know, how LA has been influencing me. Okay. I remember to stop it playing this time. <laughs> uh, so do you want to do us a little kind of kit breakdown or a, a kind of technique breakdown on what you did on that mix? Um, well, basically with this one, usually, I mean, if, if, you, if you're familiar with my style, um, for years I kind of did like this verse bridge chorus. I mean, I grew up on 80s, so 80s music. So a lot of music was much more intricate, I think, back then. Um, you know, even even back to the 70s, like, you know, if you listen to like ABBA, you know, just if you listen to some of their songs, they might have like f almost like could be four, maybe even five different parts where the music just transitions from one thing to the other to the other. So I was doing that with most of my tracks, like, you know, the music in the verse part or where the verse would be if there was vocals would be bridge chorus. In a track like this, there's still three different parts, but it was more... Uh, the journey kind of like, you know, uh, almost more like Save My Life, where it starts out one way and then transitions into another way. It's still even more complicated than some of the stuff I've done over the last few months with remixes and whatnot. So, But I think this is a, a good example of like a smoothed out, houseier track, still in embodying like the sampling style per se, just not as, you know, crazy, you know. So. And what do you favor kind of uh, kit-wise? Um... As far, I mean, you know what, I'm, I'm, look, I'm, I, exp I like to explore different things. I love, I love complexity, um, but there is an amazing art to simplicity that I really stopped uh, looking into. I mean, I think, you know, to a certain extent, I think, especially early on, there was a bit of a cop out, like, you know, oh, this part isn't strong enough. Let me make a second or a third or a fourth. You know, it's, you know, it's almost like through my own insecurity of making music, I was starting to add more and more just in case, like, oh, you're not satisfied with this part. Here's another one, you know. Um, in more recent time, I've really kind of, you know, thought about the concept of uh, let's see what we can do on a simple, like, let's see if we can make good simple music. And so far, the reaction's been good. And then I'm like, well, I guess, uh, you know, <laughs> it's not rocket science, but, <laughs> you know, it's 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 not, actually, it's it's kind of easy. The amount of sampling that I do for for those older style tracks takes a while. I mean, it used to take two to three weeks to make a track. Um, as the equipment evolved, it would be quicker and quicker. And then it's like, if you, if I, you needed a track in a day, I could do, a, a, I think, a decent Todd track in a day. Um, with house-based stuff, because you don't have to do as much sample research, it's actually a quicker process without losing, I think, the quality. It's just, you know, it's more about, you know, pardon, playing keys and just throwing a few samples in there. So each each one has its benefits and pluses and negatives so so in those two to three weeks what would you be having to be doing um well especially in when i had the, the earlier equipment i was building the track as i was going along now um after when the equipment evolved i would build sample libraries where i was uh sampling up uh 25 samples on the keys then save that bank do another one do another one so i'd be i'd be using like four banks to start with almost like if you're a chef you have all your materials, your flour, eggs, whatever, and then you just start experimenting with it. So that was the older times. In the beginning times, I'd literally build the track as I was going. So I would, you know, get the drums laid down, find a sound, start there. Then I'd go through a record, try to find an interesting sound. If I liked it, I'd sample it, try to add it in, see if it worked. If not, moved on to the next thing. So it was really just as you're going along, you're looking through records. Plus, I didn't have a lot of sampling time. So if I found something I liked and I was running out of sample time, I literally 
most of the banks were built on, if it was a 33 BPM record, I'd have to like put on 45 BPMs to speed it up. And then, you know, so it would take less sampling space and then play it low, which would give this great artifact sound, like where you just like, you know, if you played it too low, it really started to sound like a little distorted. So, so hence two to three weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, obviously, you, you had a massive connection with the UK and with France, but France came first, didn't it? France, yeah, I would say France came first, but then England took off. Mm. Uh, France was funny because I was listening to DJ Disciples' uh, show, and uh, I heard this French record, and all of a sudden they're rattling off different names and like you know different producers they're influenced by. And then I heard and Mr. Todd Edwards, and I'm like, wait, wait, was that my name? It was <laughs> like you know, and it turned out to be Saint Germain. And then, like two weeks after that, I get a call to remix one of his tracks. But you're on Teachers as well, aren't you? On the yes. Daft Punk track, yeah. you know, kind of uh, stuck between Mike Dearborn and Romanthony. Yeah, yeah. A kind of stuck right in the middle yeah. between <laughs> kind of techno and the sort of most mysterious of house producers. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you kind of you you hear this record, and then you get a call, and then you end up kind of doing. Yeah, well, they they you know they wanted me to do a remix for uh, Alabama Blues, um, and it's crazy because you know, and this is the thing, you know, I had it's funny back at that time because I was going through so much in my twenties. There were, you know, music wasn't being turned out like every five minutes where you were making putting out a track every week or every, I mean, labels were doing it, but producers I don't think were doing it as much. So I remember there were there were some dry spells where it was like a few months off, and then all of a sudden like you know. A, a remix came in and like, you know, it's almost like, wow, I haven't really done anything in a few months. Is this going to be okay? Um, the funny thing about that too is, again, I was dealing with a vocal mix and I had to borrow my friends in Sonic EPS because there wasn't enough sample time in my own keyboard to do the actual music and have the vocal at the same time. You kids have it very good, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> Should we do a little compare and contrast? Yeah. Okay then. Um, right. <laughs> Hold on, what's going <laughs> on here? Maybe not. Would you <coughs> like some help? No, I, well, I just, um, <laughs> let's just double check. Are you sure it's playing? Not sure what's happening. We could just play yeah, that your mix. You know what? If you do X out of that thing. Yeah, here we are. Just oh, I know what it is. We've got this. Yeah, you have that yeah, going. Yeah, just yeah. Fine. Thank you. Not a problem. All right, I'm fairly okay. good with technical. Yeah. Here, so. <laughs> okay, then. So are we going to play the original or your Well, if you want to give them a taste of the original, okay. and then you could hear... But funny enough... Um, it's only been over the last couple of years that people have been kind of discovering that I was the voice on Face to Face. And mm. I guess because I worked with Sirkin as well and I sang uh, on a track that we did together. But everyone's like, you sang Face to Face? You sang Face? And like, you know, and people have been requesting me to sing, which is funny because I was getting more requests to sing than I was to produce. I'm like, <laughs> you know, I am a producer, you know, right? You know, so I'm a, take what you can get, you know. <laughs> and so this time around, <coughs> with random access random memories, memories, yes. Um, what's what's your involvement this time around? I mean, I guess some of us have seen the collaborators' videos. Yes. So we know something, but yeah. what can um, you tell us? Well, again, I didn't know exactly. I knew they wanted me to sing, and I was the connection between... Dis I was the only connection between Discovery and this album. And obviously, you know, I, you know they asked. I was, you know... <laughs> no, I'm, I'll think about it. And of course, you know, it was like I was going to be on board no matter what they wanted me to do. Um, and it was a, it was just great to reconnect with them because it's it was a, it was years since I've actually hung out with them and it's really cool when you know really good people and you can just pick up where you left off. We just like you know it was you know that's what when you're good friends with someone it's it's really cool. Um, I got out to Hollywood and uh, they played a track that they wanted me to sing on. And originally, I mean, it's very gospely sounding. It's it it reminds me of like a Doobie Brothers type of track. It even has like kind of some country sound to it. It's completely different from face to face. So I was like often wondering like people might be expecting this dance track. And it's not that you can't dance to it, but it's not a a dance track. It's like almost like a, you know, more rock based, to be honest. Um, but it's a very contemporary sounding song. So Th Thomas wanted me to see if I can put some cut ups in there. So I like I say, as I said in the video, 
I was adding all these spaces. You know, I was basically doing what I would do, you know, like sampling wise, except I would uh, just, they would, I had all the musical stems and then I just put spaces in between until it sounded like something I was happy with. And, you know, I really honestly didn't know that he wanted uh, to use it as the chorus. I didn't know until he looped it around. And they didn't, they didn't play they, when they edited the collaborators video. Um, but he said to me, he's like, what did you think? I just wanted to use it for an eight bar break. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, you, I didn't know what you wanted. So I was really honored that it became uh, part of the track. And, you know, and he gave me the biggest compliment because he's like, you know, you actually helped kind of save the track because it was very because it was so contemporary sounding it didn't have any vibe that was kind of along the electronics line so you know it's nice to know that you know when you have an impact on something that's you know part of a bigger masterpiece so and then we me and thomas wrote the song together we sat in a room in uh the studio uh which you know recorded people like karen carpenter and frank sinatra i mean the funny thing is is like so where's this um well, I don't know if it's supposed to be a disclosed okay. location. Okay. I'd have to kill you all. Um, but uh, a lot of people to kill. <laughs> yeah, no. But it's it's. Um, the, well, I could I could tell you where the studio is because it's well, okay. Well, whatever. It's a really well known studio. Like you, there's a lot of people that pass through there. Um, but the it was really cool to know that the microphone that I was singing on. Aside from being more than my car's worth, it was, uh, you know, the actual mic that Frank Sinatra sang on. So not even just like, an, you know, one of them, it's the mic. I was like, you know, so I'm singing on for them. That's a crazy feeling. And uh, Did you think, ha, take that people who laughed at me <laughs> at high school? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I mean, it, the funny thing is it was my best friends that teased me all the time. <laughs> so really, I have a vendetta against them. That, no, but... Uh, um, no, it's cool because it's like it made me think. Actually, I'm like, why did I give up something that I loved so much early on? I mean, it, it kind of just shows the vulnerability of being human and how easily, and especially I think as producers, it's like you, part of being a producer, you want to be loved. You you need an audience, and how easily it's like you know I'm been in it for 20 years, and it's still not easy to hear negative criticism. You know, it's like, you know, no matter how much success you have, you want to be loved. You know what I mean? You need that connection and have people be, have joy from your work, you know? So t to have people picking up on this now, it's like, it's almost like I'm doing something cool. later on in my career that most people do, you know, early, you know, most people do at the beginning of their career, but whether it be DJing or just singing and just, you know, it's kind of like a renaissance for me. And I, I saw Noel Rogers saying, uh, kind of offering you free, unfettered access. How to sick his was that? <laughs> to his full archive. Yeah. What yeah. was his exact words? I don't even remember offhand. It was just like, I have, we found all these, like, you know, these old jams. It's like, maybe you put your touch on it or something to paraphrase it. But uh, that's amazing. I mean, you know, even just in the collaborators video, it's like you have Georgia Marauder, then mine, then Niall Rogers. Like, I'm sandwiched between two titans from the 70s and 80s. I mean, it's a complete honor to, to be part of that. So is that archive access going to happen then? Uh, we are we're definitely going to pursue that. I'm not going to, you know, mm. definitely. I would love to get my hands on that. And, I, you know, I mean, the thing about it is like when you hear the track I did on Random Access Memories uh, with Toma and Guimond, they, they, you know, it's funny because you can hear the cut-ups, but it's very smooth. It's not like it's this overt sloppy chop thing it's very polished and i think it's a good example of how this you know it's one example of how my style can fit into different genres which i intend to show further as i'm going along in my career mm -hmm. so france obviously led you to some interesting places culminating in a mm -hmm. kind of very interesting place right now but england london in particular yeah. took you to some other places maybe in a kind of uh, in a more intense way yeah how did you first, I mean, I guess, you know, you've talked before about how you found out. It just kind of, you started to hear that people in London were kind of into your tracks. Yes. Um, but what was it that made you realize that something kind of significant was happening? A, a new sort of version of UK street music was basically <coughs> being based on your sound. Um, <coughs> it really happened in a very subtle way because, again, there was really no internet at the time, or at least I wasn't connected to it in, and I was, I had moved on with my sound. I was always taking my cues from Masters at Work. Masters at Work was, did this, like I said, they did these slew of remixes in the early 90s. And then they started to incorporate live uh, bass players into their work. And 
they were almost making disco based tracks. And then there was also the Basement Jacks, mm-hmm. who had a, I mean, that was the other thing, in, being introduced to their sound. They were doing these like disco y, Latin y sounding things, and that was really inspiring. So I had moved on to almost less cut ups and more taking the samples and trying to make it sound like a disco band when I was doing these remixes. And I had a lot of success doing that. I, uh, I did a track on a remix on uh, uh, Nervous Records called The Panther Party, and that hit, hit number one on the dance charts, at least in the magazines at DJ Magazine. And um, there was a track called Jump to My Beat by Wild Child that I had remixed, and that, that was the first one that really hit off. And again, it's just like it starts a slew, a chain reaction of remixes, but they were all disco based style. And then all of a sudden, my manager's like, there's something going on in England. People are picking up on your older sound. And my first thing wasn't even joy. It was like, I mean, I got to go back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I got to go back and do this again. It's like, I've moved on. You know, it's like I'm evolving into something else. So I almost had to relearn my own style, which was difficult because, uh, you know, when you're in one mindset and then you got to like reverse gears, it was, uh, it was a little frustrating. That's an interesting conundrum for an artist to find themselves in. Yeah. It hadn't occurred to me that that would be the case. I guess you know, from a UK perspective, suddenly you were the person that everyone was referencing and not just kind of people from one style. It was like you're kind of grime people and you're kind of what would be grime. Yes. uh, And garagey people. And it just seemed like across the board, everyone was looking to you, but they were making so many different types of sounds. But for you, you were having to revisit something. Yes. Yeah, it's crazy. How did that, like that revisiting... Like, what did that do to you or do for you? I mean, I, um, don't, I don't mean so much in success, but kind of creatively. No, no I know what you mean. Uh, no, I mean, it was, I'm glad it happened because I, I, I embraced it once I got back into it. I really did. And it made me start to explore, you know, I think that's where I started to get very complicated because I realized with the sampling, you could really just, you know, it's an art form. I mean, like you can make a really great musical collage. And, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, you listen to Mozart and you just hear how many notes... <laughs> he puts in in his work and and you know and i loved that complexity like to have everything make sense in a track but just have so many things going on but still work harmoniously through it and that was kind of like something i wanted to evolve into so for me it was just continuously exploring new samples i I started sampling from the 60s instead of the 70s and i learned more about music through sampling than i did from actually just sitting down and listening to music so. But from your point of view, which of your records were the ones that had the most impact on what became kind of Two Step? Um, well, as far as Two Step, I wasn't. I mean, the funny thing is, is people associate me with Two Step, but I had nothing to do with the yeah. the onslaught of Two Step. Um, you know, I forgot the name of the producer that he did a track uh, a remix for "Never Let You Go." Um, go on. So, but so if you don't, if it wasn't that bit, then so the question really then is, which <laughs> track? Which track for you is the one that you think had the most impact it in the was, UK? I would say there's there's several. There's Save My Life, Alabama Blues, which you heard. And there was another track. I did a remix for Sounds of One called As I Am. And that's I, I think that's considered a classic. I mean, that gets played and it still gets a really good response, even to people that don't really know the earlier UK garage mm-hmm. stuff. So, And what kind, of, what kind of connection did you have with those artists? Um, well, Save My Life, obviously, was me. Saint Germain was, uh, I didn't really know. Him. Like you said, that was... I mean, like the the, UK, the people in the UK that the UK. were being kind of picking up on your sound and being oh. inspired by it. What connection did you have with um, them? With them? Uh, well, I got to know the best. I knew uh, Tough Jam, which was uh, Carl Tough Enough Brown and Matt Jam Lamont. We developed more of a rapport. And then after that on my who i consider to be my biggest supporter is dj ez which if you don't know him look him up he has a boiler room out and he's a massively inspiring technical dj and i don't want to say underrated because i hate that term when people hugely use influential. it he's huge hugely influential he's just you know i think that again it's just like he's so known in the uk scene that there's there might not be people that know him as well in the American scene, but he's just like you watch him DJ and he's just he plays CDJs the way you'd play a drum machine. I mean, he it's it's amazing to watch. I'm dumbfounded, you know. So how did you? What, what kind of connections did you make with those people? Was it just like if they had come to the US, they'd come and find you, or were you in the UK, or like yeah, well, I mean, writing I, you postcards? What happened? Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, I ended up going to. Uh, Carl, uh, Carl's studio. We we collaborated on some tracks there. Um, he, they also came to my studio in Jersey. So, I, I think it was uh, 
the first time I actually met them face to face was in 1998 at the Winter Music Conference. So, and uh, but yeah, I mean, you know how it, I mean. Again, you talk on the phone with the internet. Everything's you know even more now. It's just like everything brings you closer together. Um, the first uh, one of the first times I got to hang out with DJ EZ is he brought me over for uh, this four by four gig at Time and Envy, and that was the first dose. And when was that? I think that was around 2002, 2003. And that was, it might have been a little late, I think around that. So I'm, I'm, so the years like are the just mid, running into each other. Mid 2000s. Um, but the thing is, is he, what do you call it? He, that was the first dose of knowing what a huge audience was like. I mean, I, I knew it was popular, but the reaction I got from these 1,500 people was epic, you know, so. How did you cope with the accents? Oh, so <laughs> I pretended I understood what they were saying, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, some of them are really strong. And even just the slang, it's just like I need an interpreter to understand what the hell they were talking about. I wondered <coughs> whether there were kind of any UK garage records you wished you'd in. Th say that again? I wonder if there was any UK... See? See? Yeah, See what no, I mean? that's a perfect example. <laughs> what did you say? If there were any kind of UK garage records that you wish you'd written, that you'd made. No, I mean, I'm... I, I mean... It, I have my own agenda. I mean, like, I'm looking to just make great art, so I don't covet anyone. I think, uh, to be honest, if there's anyone that I put as a role model as to what I would like to accomplish on a even on an independent le uh, level is Daft. I mean, like, you know, what you know, they put on an amazing live show. They've scored a film. Like, these are things that I wanted, you know, I still want to put together a live show. I just haven't done it, you know, and even just to get into scoring is something I'd really like to do, so. And is, is the live show going to be happening in any shape or form? Um, well, right now I'm putting together a vocal album, and it's basically, it was kind of t uh, Thomas's idea. It was just like, you know, your vocals should be the center point of who you are and connecting the past and the present. He's like, and I think you should focus on songwriting, so... Um, Scion AV is by, is backing me for an album, so I'm going to be releasing with them. And uh, Peter Franco, who's the engineer on the for the Random Access Memory, engineered the in the you know mixed down the album. He wanted he asked he was like I want to work with you, so I was like, of course I'm going to say yes. He's amazing. He's an amazing engineer and a, and a great producer. He also produces the group Jamaica. So I'll be writing songs. We're going to work on you know uh, polishing them up and then making the production to enhance the songs. And then basically I'll probably remix the album myself to make it dancey. But the album's going to be more of a vocal album. So Cool, lovely. I think we should kind of pass it out to questions yes. from you fine folk. Uh, do we have the microphone to hand? Excellent. Um, so do we have... I didn't really give you any warning. Does anyone have a question kind of ready? Or shall we continue here for one minute? The natives are getting restless. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to be putting it out to you lot for in a minute for questions. I'm sure you'll have some ready. Um, in the meantime, is there anything else that you've got kind of uh, coming up that we should know about? Like I said, the vocal album is definitely something I'm looking to release around September or October. After that, I really just want to do more collaborations. I, I worked on a track with Power One, and I'm looking to, to do more with him. I would love to work with Cirkin again. And there's just a lot of vocals I'm looking to work with. Also, I, I saw DJ Falcon, who also has a track on the album. And I'm like, you know, like, I just, honestly, I'm at a point where it's like I've proven what I can, I can do. I really just want to enjoy myself and have some fun collaborating with friends in the industry. And I also want to take the sampling thing to a different place as well. And maybe we'll reach a mass audience or just a small group of people. But, you know, I, it's a personal, you know, personal creative goals. And then there's you know, the concept of keeping the dance thing going. Um, I have a small label called New Trend Music, and <clears throat> it's honestly, I did it more as a hobby, and I've been so tied to iRecords for so long, I just wanted something of my own. I haven't really developed it uh, or even promoted it, and I made some money off of it already, which was cool, but it's probably going to be for the diehard fans release, like UK Garage stuff that, you know, that the, the, the diehard fans want. So that's definitely future as well. And uh, didn't you once make a jazz record as well? Yeah, um, there was more a jazz. There's a tra there's an album called Jazz Love Spirit. Um, it was me uh, and a couple other producers, Kevin Yost, who's on I Records. Um, unfortunately, it's uh, there's a lot that are under uh, fake names, which I didn't come up with. It's Jazz Love Spirit on I Records. So, and it was basically no, no samples really. There's only one track that had a sample. The rest of it was just all me playing and just like you know. 
uh, uh, jazz solos and stuff. So I can do a lot more than people know. It's just a matter of taking the time to showcase it by putting more music out. So. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So uh, what do we have question-wise from the people? Hi, it's a real pleasure. I would like to know if there is any logical process involved in during sample searching and uh, how to figure out how to m a way to, to match the key because sometimes samples come from different stuff with different key, different tempos and if there can be a, a strategy to, to figure out how to meld them together in a, an organic way. Um, part of it is your ear, you know, the, your ability to hear when two things are in key. Um, also, a lot of the sampling time, I'm, I'm, I'm usually looking for certain textures. Like I like, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of female vocals. I also like the way organs sound with like cymbal sounds on top of it, almost like that gives you this like a scratchy, you know, sound with like an organ. You know, it, again, sampling is really more about what you're using for your uh, your palette of colors. Like if you like to work with red, black, blue, whatever. And so it's the same thing. Um, as far as matching the key, the keys, you know, like I said, it comes from your ear, you know, and having your ear. And then on top of that, what gets frustrating sometimes is if you have a track that's in a key and you have a sample that's off by more than three half steps, like, you know, the, the sample loses its quality. If you, if you pitch something up like five or six notes, it starts to sound like almost like chip. Even if you were, even if you formatted it or like you know used a format to bring it down, it just it loses its quality. Or if you pitch it down too low to match with the key that you're in. So usually I try to you know it's usually samples that are within three notes of the key that I'm playing in. So but there's no beginning strategy. I literally just sample libraries and just have them ready when I'm working on a remix or if I'm starting a track. I used to start with just four libraries of 25 samples each, and now I do like 16. So I'm starting out between three to 500 samples, just so I don't have to go back to the drawing board to find more when I'm working on a remix or a track. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, yeah. Um, do you work on a door, or do you use more of a, um, a sampler? And if you use a door, do you work in audio, or do you trigger things from MIDI? Uh, did you say a door? Door, like a digital audio workstation. Um, I, well, for the longest time, um, I'm, I've been using Digital Performer, mm. uh, as a, and I had I used an S6, a Kai S6000 sampler, which is still used to zip disks, so I was still buying those off of eBay. Um, I just switched up to Pro Tools, and I just invested in Contact Complete, um, only for a sampler until I heard all the sounds it came with, and it was like it was better than anything that I had. <laughs> with the exception of a Juno 106, it was uh, better than anything I had in my studio. So we're definitely streamlining the studio. Um, I also bought Melodyne. I've been using that. But, uh, you know, Pro Tools is the replacement as far as what I've been using. So. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. You said that um, you know, there's a lot of ups and downs when you're doing more uh, when you're doing what you love, and uh, I think we've all experienced highs, and then you can go way down low, and just you're like, why did that just happen? I don't get it. Like you know, and uh, when you're in the low part, what uh, do you do? You feel the need to change anything, or do you just kind of stay the course and wait to come back up, or do you feel pressure to? Oh, am I doing something wrong? And uh, should I change or do you just stay true to yourself? Pretty much. Um, I, I mean, the thing is, I don't think that you should just jump on a bandwagon. I mean, well, I you know, like within your style specifically, oh, like, like um, not not like oh, I need to do something, to do something completely, completely different. different. Yeah, like do I need to kind I mean, of change my style a little? Or i I mean, early on, I realized there was no logic in music. James Bratton on One Eleven East said he's like, "There's no logic," and he's right. You know, there are tracks that I'll do that, uh, that I think are, you know, personally, I love them. I think they're amazing and get a minimal response. And then there might be a track that I do that I absolutely think is just, eh, and 
it gets an amazing response. And I'm like, I don't get it. I just don't get it. So I try to make crap music because it's usually the crap music that does <laughs> that does well. You know, no, I mean, um, no, I mean, I, I think you just have to, honestly, I think the, 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 the hardest thing, but the thing that's most important is to have a thick skin. To be honest, in my 20s, I wanted to quit every five minutes. Honestly, I really believe God intervened because every time that I wanted to quit making music, a door would open, a remix would come in, or even the potential of a remix to come in. Um, and I, I honestly believe if I didn't have the success that I had, I'd still be extremely like unstable and insecure. But I think that my confidence probably came from the success I had, which isn't really healthy. Right? But we're artists. I mean, we're all a little bit nuts. And, uh, you know, you have to just kind of stick the course. Do it. I, I, the, and the one thing that I really learned from just working a regular job for two years and being miserable at it is I'd rather be poor and do what I love and, you know, then to, uh, you know, I was dying a little and I was making good money. I mean, I literally could have had a stable life after that, but I'm like, I don't want that. I mean, like, think about it. I've had a lot of success and there's still a lot of financial stress up and down. I've had a lot of money. I've had no money. It's like, it is, this is, this is a part of the life that you're living. Just do it because you love to do it. Don't do it because you're looking to be famous. You know, don't do it just for the money. Do it because you're looking to make art and that you want to have an audience. And I think if you stay true to that, you'll find your audience. And I think it's great now. I mean, that's the beauty of the internet is like, you know, even if you're a niche market, you can pull people from all over the place to make up a market. You know, like I said, I mean, you know, if you could put out a track and you have, you know, people downloading it, you're making 800 here, 500 here, 200 there. It's like it all adds up, you know, even on a small level. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. I also wanted to ask you about, uh, you had brought up that you had a manager at a lot of points, and I've been asking a lot of artists how they feel about managers, Mm -hmm. because it seems to be either they love them or they hate them. Yeah. And so I can't really grasp which one. (laughs) Um, I was a very weak person, and I had very little connection to the rest of the world. Um, My ex-manager basically was my bridge to the music world, and I wasn't really big on the internet. I was kind of like, you know, late in getting on that. So he was the gatekeeper. I wouldn't recommend having it that way. Um, uh, you know, in a, not to get too personal, but he, he was a very negative person. And uh, as I matured, I kind of saw it for more what it was. But I still, you know, it's, you know when you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place, like even if you recognize the negative situation, you don't really know to, where to go. And I literally had a bottom out on a musical scale to and get that job before I actually left the situation. Um, and, you know, again, there's a lot of negative things that could happen. I think that, you know, it could, it can go either way, but I also believe that now on the, on the flip side of everything, my manager, uh, Alexis Rivera, who throws the party club called Rhonda in LA four months with him. And there was already a major buzz with, uh, you know, with working with him you know, I think it's good if you can be a good judge of character, if you can read people and know what they're like. And, you know, you know, I th- everyone around me had said negative things about my ex-manager and I defended him at points and stuff. I, when you're young, you don't know any better. You're immature, you know. And again, it was different now, at least. Even if you don't have a manager, you can go searching for one. You can do stuff through the internet. Whereas before, you know, that person was making all the connections for you. I would recommend have you. I think longevity, you need to have a good team behind you. Since I've had Alexis, uh, I've, I've gotten a European booking agent, Belinda Law, who's done amazing work. I'm always in London every three months. Um, he books my North American gigs, and he's connected me to a lot of different people. I owe him a lot, and I always uh, sing his praises in interviews and whatnot. So I think a good manager is definitely necessary for longevity. Cool. Thank you. Because I had something else I did want to just quickly ask you before we wrap up then. And that's, I wonder sometimes whether or not you hear artists and feel like they're almost children of your sound. You know, are there people that you hear where you think, ah, there's there's a bit of me in there? Yeah, I mean, well, there's a lot of UK kids that, uh, you know, it was funny, uh, DJ Q from England, he he did a mix uh, like uh, of all my stuff and it got really big. It got covered by Fact Magazine and he's a great guy. He did a, he did a dub mix of one of his tracks and he literally sampled a sample from a group that I've sampled from. I'm like, wait a second. It's like, it's, it's an English boys choir. I'm like, there's no way that like, you know, he would have just found that on his own if he didn't sample it. And there's other people, 
you know, I've, I've heard over the years people sampling my drums, you know, people doing the cut-ups the same way. But then again, like, I took my sound from MK, so it's... Uh, and I don't know. mean that in a yeah, kind of yeah, this negative. way. So I yeah, mean yeah, it, in, a like, it is. It's a, it's in a way of you seeing of what course. kind of yeah. your thing has created definitely. in a completely different environment. Yes. You know, the way Burial sampled all those female vocalists off YouTube or wherever yeah. and turned them into something else. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, do, do you hear kind of like a little bit of what you did in those things? Definitely, definitely. I mean, I've heard some dubstep things but it's hard to you know it's hard to pinpoint because there's a lot of different people that take their influence into influ influences from different areas but uh it's definitely recognizable i think sam it's kind of funny because sampling isn't as big as in house music but i think you can hear it in a lot of different other forms of electronic music you know whether it just be piano riffs or whatnot like here's something that justice did i mean you know uh Guimon had mentioned he's like you know here's sebastian uh uh you know he did the cut up thing. And then, you know, he, justice kind of took some stuff from this. At least this is what I've heard, but it's like justice kind of learned from Sebastian. So it's kind of like this branch that just trickles out. So it's, I'm glad to be part of the tapestry. It's cool. And, uh, ever modest Todd Edwards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.